So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to talk at the UFS workshop. Uh, here are my collaborators, Stefan Tulek, Maria Gana on a pre-COVID picture, and then uh, George Kiladis uh, at C Series and, and the Physical Science Laboratory at, no at NOAA. So the re reason why we're interested in this type of uh, nudging experiments comes from what we know about tropical to extratropical teleconnections. And here, uh, what, it, what it means is that um, at the atmospheric response to variations in tropical heating extends well beyond its source region. This is a fairly well uh, explained, uh, Rossby wave source theory very, uh, well explains this type of phenomena. And here on the left side, I'm just showing you a couple of known pathways for this tropical to extratropical uh, teleconnection at intraseasonal time scales, in particular, because that's what uh, I'm going to focus on today. And to be a bit more concrete about what I mean when I'm talking about tropical to extratropical teleconnections, I'm going to show you a, f a couple of figures from Brent Stetter, 2014 where he superimposed a two-day pulse of heat near the equator on many realizations of a free run of uh, CAM3 on January 1st. And what you're looking at here is the day three ensemble mean response to this forcing and you can, uh, in upper-level meridiana winds where you can see this wave train uh, expanding well beyond its forcing region. And by moving this heat source ar ar around the globe, he also looked at the evolution of this uh, signal as a function of integration time. And for example, for sea level pressure, you can see that there's a peak in the response at day seven over the mid latitudes. But of course, if you're thinking of predictions, this is a bit more complicated because the exact pathway of this response will depend on the basic stage and on the um, characteristics of this latent heating uh, source. And there's a number of studies that have looked at this uh, questions. But what's important here for our uh, talk is that there is this pathway for tropical forecast errors to move away from, from its source region. And one way that people have looked at this in numerical weather prediction systems is by performing what's known as a relaxation type of experiment or nudging. And in our uh, case here, what that means is that we're going to relax the forecast to observations over a limited region near the equator, and then the, the system runs freely uh, beyond that uh, tropical Bench. And the ECMWF has a long history of looking at this type of experiments, and I'm going to illustrate the general conclusions from it based on some figures from Young et al. 2010. So what you're looking at here at the top is the mean absolute error over 10 years of wintertime reforecasts, roughly on week 2, 3, and 4 potential heights at 500 millibars. And then the next two rows show difference in mean absolute errors between nudge experiments and uh, the free forecast. In the middle row, a case where only SSTs are relaxed to observations. And then at the bottom, the case where the entire tropical atmosphere was relaxed to observations. And you can see that by uh, artificially reducing er errors in the tropics, you end up with much reduced errors over particular regions of the northern hemisphere. So the overall conclusion from this type of study is that the extratropics do draw some skill from the tropics at subseasonal time scales. And what that, but what I'm interested in today for, for this talk is whether the UFS produced consistent results with our expectations from these previous studies. We're also interested in whether this uh, uh, error reduction has an imprint in surface variables, for example, precipitation subseasonal sub predictions, and also on how much of this change in remote scale depends on the initial stage of the model versus on tropical model errors. And 
said differently this uh, we're interested in the question of how much of this error reduction is achievable via mo model improvements versus how much is not because of uh, intrinsic predictability limits so for our implementation we used an early version of the ufs with prescribed ssts as used in, in operations we use incremental analysis update as opposed to the traditional nudging where you uh, use newtonian uh, you relax the prognostic equations and we do that because with the iau approach uh, we can do everything on the script level so it makes it really easy to port across versions of the the ufs and it in the end it produces very similar re results to the standard newtonian uh, damping all of our experiments are run on gaia at C128, which is roughly a degree uh, horizontal resolution, and then uh, we are relaxing all of our, ver uh, ver our forecast uh, fields to error uh, interim. So here is a couple of the setups we have tested so far. Uh, this white tropical nudging case is very similar to what Young et al. 2010 used. We also tested a narrow tro tropical nudging region where full nudging is applied only between five south and five north. And we also tested the impact of, of nudging uh, different sets of variables. Our reforecast period is about 20 years. It's 20 years from 1999 to 2018, with initializations every five days from November through March. And our forecasts run out to 30 days. Answering the first question I posed a couple of slides ago, the UFS does produce uh, consistent results with what we expected from the CMWF works, and that, that's what I'm illustrating here. At the top, you're looking at Z500 average over those 20 years uh, for week one through four, and then at, this, at the bottom row, you're looking at the difference between the tropical nudging experiment ver uh, minus the the free forecast and you can see those regions those blue regions highlighting areas outside the nudging region where errors are reduced and you can see that those reductions are uh, particularly uh, significant over the nor north pacific united states and atlantic ocean and you can also see that reductions tend to be larger in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere over the, the winter. Uh, answering my second question uh, regarding precipitation errors, we ca that's what I'm looking, we are looking at here, focusing on the, over the, the United States. And what you're seeing are actual um, percentage error reductions in mean absolute error. So the darkest blues are showing regions where reductions are out to 40, 50%. Not surprisingly, near the edge of the nudging region, you see those large reductions, but then it's interesting to see how errors are redu also reduced over the Western United States, and those redu uh, reductions in increase with, with lead time out to, to week four. We also see this when we uh, nudge the tropics less in the sense that uh, in that narrow setup where nudging was applied only between five south and five north we still see some substantial uh, portions of the western united states with uh, where errors are reduced uh, normally pattern correlations are also improved in this type of experiment and that's what i'm going to show you next we're going to look at anomaly pattern correlations over this red uh, region here highlighted on the left side and you can see that similarly to the mean absolute error on week one uh, anomaly pattern correlations are similar between the free forecast and the nudge experiments both in z500 and precipitation but by week two you start seeing some uh, start seeing that the nudge experiments tend to perform better than the, the free forecast and those differences increase with lead time, even for our case of very, very narrow uh, nudging. Three minutes remind. Okay. Um, 
there's also a, a, a change in the histogram of these anomaly pattern correlations over our forecast period. Then that's what I'm illustrating here at the top with Z500 and bottom of precipitation. And you can see that uh, the, the gray bars are showing the, the free forecast histogram. And you can see that, that comparing that to the, the lines, which are the histograms for the nudge experience, every, all, all the anomaly pattern correlations tend to be more skewed and, and peaked for both uh, variables showed here. So in particular, you tend to have uh, an improve, improvement in the number of forecasts with positive anomaly pattern correlation scores. And the last thing I, I want to briefly touch on is uh, the issue, the, the question of whether this is influenced by the, the MJO. And to do that, we're going to use the OMI, which is an OLR-based MJO index, at initialization. So I'm just looking at the question of whether uh, how this tropical extra tropical forecast error relationship depends on the initial state of the MJO. And the first thing to notice is that the UFS, regardless of any tropical nudging, is sensitive to the MJO initial state in terms of its um, yeah, predict precipitation skill over mid latitudes. And to look at that, we have conditioned the anomaly pattern correlations over between the cases where the MGO was active at initial time versus weak. That's the, the active case are the blue, in a uh, weak case are the, the orange. And what you're looking here at the bottom is the relative skill in the in the free forecast or the control, which is showing that when the MGO is active, you tend to have better skill at week two over uh, the United, uh, Western United States, and you have, tend to have much worse skill at week two and three when the MJO is, is weak. And this is in contrast to what we see when we nudge the tropics, where you still see uh, the, the overall skill is higher between free and, and nudge, but even within the, the nudge um, reforecast, you still see an improvement in week two skill when the MJO is active, but now you also see an added uh, skill at longer lead times, perhaps because now the MGO can propagate and, does, and uh, it, the, the MGO life, life cycle is properly represented in the model. We also see that uh, week two and three forecasts uh, tend to perform close to, to average when the MGO is inactive. And that's one of the, the things that we are interested in um, for uh, looking at, for example, what's the role of tropical synoptic model modes of variability in helping us realize this potential. And I'll leave you with my summary slide here. Thank you very much, Juliana, for the very on-time presentation, uh, regardless of the technical mm -hmm. difficulties. And it's a very interesting talk. Evan, would you uh, be able to pass on any questions from Slack channel? Yes, we do have one question in Slack. Uh, this is from Jo Wong. Uh, she asks, it seems that one of your slides shows an increase in MAAE over East Asia. If so, why does the MAE decrease in some regions but increase in some other regions with nudging? Uh, yeah, uh, I think she's referring to, to this re the red areas here. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly. I, uh, you can see that in, in other relaxation is, is studies as well, and that's something that we should look at. Uh, one thing that I have noticed is as, uh, as I increase my sample size, I tend to have less of this and more of the blue. So maybe it's not, it's not as systematic of the signal as the reduction, but I don't, I don't know what the reason is. Right. Um, thank you so much, Juliana, for your uh, answer. And I think in the interest of time, we might move forward uh, with next speaker. So our next talk will be given by Dylan Blanc on the an, on an evaluation of vertical thermodynamic profiles and uh, derived stability parameters uh, from parallel FV3 and spectrum model GFS forecasts. Uh, let's uh, 
Okay, great. Then we have the share screen available and I will do the same uh, practice, remind you uh, when you have three minutes left, okay? Okay, can you see my screen? Good. Yes, we can see your full screen presentation. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about the evaluation of vertical thermodynamic profiles and draft stability parameters from parallel and B3 and spectral GFS forecast. Uh, uh, sorry, Dylan. Uh, sorry for interruption. Can you uh, get closer to your mic and make sure because there we still can hear a lot of a uh, uh, noise noise. But uh, if that's if that's the case, then we have to go with that. Otherwise, if you can get closer and make your sound clear, that'll be better. Thanks. Does it sound a little bit better? Yes. Okay. Great. I want to give a special thanks to Clark Evans, my advisor at UW Milwaukee, and Israel and the Indian Epistemic Patient Center with, for help on this project. So a little motivation, uh, the previous GFS version 14 had issues in continental environments. Uh, SPC noted that the boundary layer is too warm and dry in one season thunderstorm uh, environments. And you can see this on the above uh, figures. On the left figure, you can see in western, northwestern Texas and western Oklahoma, where a dry line is set up, there's a uh, dry dew point bias of negative of five to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see in that area, it is too dry. And then just a couple hours later, uh, sounding from Amarillo, Texas, show uh, in purple on the right figure, uh, showed this uh, structure, mixed boundary layer structure. And then the GFS was too warm and dry with this, leading to a more mixed uh, boundary layer. However, more broadly, uh, hand it all 2016 showed it came too cool and moist. So a hypothesis we went with was the FE3 will have similar issues to the previous GFS because the dynamical core update did not adequately address the boundary layer processes that lead to issues in continental warm season thunderstorm supporting environments. So it is uh, good to know that we do want to look at these warm season thunderstorm supporting environments. So for our methods, uh, we evaluated model forecast profiles from the spectrum version 14 and the FE3 uh, 15.3. Uh, from May to June of 2019, when we were running in parallel, we considered uh, 0Z and 12Z forecast cycles with mean times uh, out to 36 hours every 12 hours. And we did want to focus on these thunderstorm and fire supporting environments uh, due to the SPC need for those. There's a caveat, the data simulation is tied to a spectral version of the GFS, so this could introduce some uh, initial condition biases into the finite volume forecasts. So moving into some of the results, this is uh, from the zero D initialization times. Uh, if you look at four panels across the rows, it's how time goes to 0, 12, 24, and 36 hours with the number of soundings in the titles for each panel. We can see in the red is red dash is the temperature for the FE3. The pink dash is GFS temperature. The blue is FE3 dew point, and the teal color is GFS dew point. And the dots on the sides indicate the uh, statistical significance uh, different from zero. Testing using a two tailed non parametric Wilcoxon sign rate test. So, there's a few things to note um, with this. There's a noise bias um, consistent with the handle of 2016 shown throughout the vertical um, levels. And sorry, I meant to mention this goes from zero to five thousand uh, meters, and this is how to walk around with it. So the moist bias is in the entire vertical profile in both versions of the GFS. In the FE3 version, there is a more significant cold bias at the 12 and 36 hour forecast, and it goes up to about one degree Celsius. So moving on to, we looked at surface-based tape greater than 100 joules per kilogram. 
and as you can really see right here, the cold bias is still present in that 12 and 36 hour forecast, and it seems to be just a little bit more significant than the previous slide. And the profiles are still similar for each of the, the GFS and the FE3. So the profiles don't uh, differ that significantly. And there is a dry bias, sorry about that. There is a dry bias at the uh, 12 UTC timeframes in the last three and a half kilometers. So since the profiles seem to be fairly similar for both versions of the GFS, we decided to look at which layer cake greater than 500 joules per kilogram of just the FV3 only in this period runs from May and November of 2019. So you're looking at the same uh, type of charts. And there's a couple of things to note here. This cold bias is still present in the lowest level uh, up to a degree Celsius. There's a dry bias in every uh, one of the profiles uh, in the 0 and 24 hour forecast. It's uh, about one to one and a half kilometers. And in the 12 and 36 hour forecast, it's up to three and a half, uh, three to three and a half kilometers. So you do, you can note that it is uh, too uh, dry. And then, uh, we believe that it's not too warm in this case because of such the, such a large cold bias that it needed to overcome, but it doesn't uh, adequately overcome this for daytime heating. So some key takeaways thus far is there's evidence supporting both the Anadol 2016 and the Storm Prediction Center findings. And the Storm Prediction Center findings are primarily for thunderstorm supporting environments. And there's no significant differences in all of the profiles between a spectral and binary volume uh, cores in the GFS. So our hypothesis was not rejected. And all of this was a uh, subjective analysis uh, that we did. And we wanted to uh, dive into more of an objective analysis. So that's what I'm going to move into next. So the boundary layer structure is predicted with an eddy diffusivity. To, uh, for stable environments, counter gradient for neutral and weakly unstable, and mass flux for strongly unstable in the range of 15 and, 15, uh, 15 and 14 uh, GFS. Uh, the environmental based stratifications that we did earlier uh, can help isolate these stabilities, but it's not a guarantee. So, how can we objectively classify sound rate soundings in the boundary layer? Emerge under these different types of stability conditions. So, first, uh, we normalized soundings. So, we calculated the surface for bulk temperature and then used that what bulk temperature to uh, plot a noise ADF of that, as shown in the thick black line on the sounding. And then we subtracted the temperature from the demand. Or Temperature minus the moist ADV and the dew point minus the moist ADV to kind of get a normalized sounding. Uh, we also only looked in the last five kilometers above ground level for each of these soundings. And this is a type of sounding structure that we get. So it's very similar uh, to the CT sounding. And you can look this sounding from Alaska. So it shows that we can represent. Uh, Boundary layers that are mixed in different types of uh, places. So that's what we were looking for with this. So we looked at 16,344 observed soundings were made to November 2019, and all of these were normalized and examined. We then did a single volume decomposition uh, to obtain the leading EOFs and PCs using temperature only. Uh, we use these to uh, do a gains clustering and identify the patterns in the data. So you can see on the figure at right, uh, this, we use the first two EOFs because that contains 95% of the variance in, in the data. So then within each of these clusters, we have composite mean profiles for each uh, cluster and visualize that. So this is, we use k equals 4 uh, to get the most robust solution in terms of separating the data. It uh, separated it by using both EOF 1 and 2, and then it didn't uh, break up one of the clusters as in k equals 5 did. So this was the most robust solution. 
and you can see that each cluster is colored and then the centroid is the, the black X. So the third overall that we used, um, that we found from that data, uh, we can see red is cluster one, blue is cluster two, green is cluster three, and then yellow is cluster four. The right is the temperature that we used in that analysis. And then the, the corresponding viewpoint is on the left with the gray shading indicating uh, two standard deviation on each side uncertainty. So you can see cluster one uh, resembles the shallow mixed layer cap by inversion. Cluster two resembles a near surface inversion. Cluster three resembles a shallow uncapped mixed layer. And then cluster four resembles a deeper mixed layers. So we did show that you can uh, find different types of environments using this normalization. Three minutes. Thank you. So for some future work that we want to do, uh, we want to look at a multivariate UF analysis or self-organizing analysis based on temperature and dew point profiles instead of just that temperature profile. And then do the same kind of analysis where we find and posit uh, soundings from each of these, and then we're going to verify these boundings uh, to the forecast from the GFS for each uh, of the different sounding structures. And then we want to repeat this for GFS uh, version 15 or version 16 upgrade, uh, which changes the PDL parameterization to a scalar total kinetic energy based in units. And vertical resolution uh, is also going to increase as well. And we want to demonstrate a proof of concept for this uh, sounding classification clustering technique. So it could be something that uh, other model evaluators could use in the future for public packages. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, that's a very interesting talk. Uh, let's see, Evan, do we have any questions from Slack? So I don't see any questions in the Slack channel at the moment, uh, but I do have a question for Dylan if right. there's time. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. Uh, so Dylan, my question is, you know, you you implied that the direction of the bias differs depending on the stability, you know, thunderstorm environment versus non-thunderstorm environment. And I'm wondering if that implies that the direction of the bias depends on whether the mass flux scheme is engaged in the in the PBL or not. Yeah, so that's kind of what we want to look at with these uh, very sounding structures. We actually want to you know break it down and see the stability classification where the PBL amortization is it. What in there? When does that initiate and uh, how does that bias occur within each of those classifications? Okay, yep. sounds good. Thanks. That's very good. Um, and I do have another question for you, Dylan, uh, but maybe not a question, just maybe a comment that you definitely want to focus on PBL, but at the same time, the surface physics might also play a very important role. And also the event or like cloud above the uh, boundary layer might also impact your uh, analysis. So maybe there's a way to stratify the data a little bit more and then uh, separate the regimes to make sure the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, results are, are relevant. So that's kind of a more of a comment than question. Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, I think if we don't see any questions from, oh, I think, uh, Oh yeah, I think that's still on Slack. We're we keeping very active uh, interaction. So I encourage uh, the attendee to uh, interact in on the Slack channel with the speaker. And let's move on to our next presentation given by Xiao Wu Bao on use satellite data to evaluate the physics schemes and their scale sensitivity for FE3 GFS. And here we go, Xiao Wu. Okay, thank you, Lulin. So can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'll do the same practice. So remind you uh, when you have three minutes left. 
Okay. So I will be talking about <clears throat> using satellite data to evaluate the FV3 GFS model. Uh, what we want to do is, let me minimize this window. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to compare the NOAA goals R infrared brightness temperature with the model generated the synthetic ones to see if there is any bias. And uh, if there is a bias, we want to explore what may be the problems that cause the bias and how to fix that. So we did the evaluation on these four different degrees to see the scale sensitivity. Here is just uh, an example to let you see what the data look like. Uh, on the left, it is observed goes R, IR brightness temperature, BT. And on the right is uh, from the model generated synthetic ones. So the model run is global, but we uh, interpolated the global model output to this US corners domain. So we made sure the observation and the model are on exactly the same domain. So we are comparing apple to apples. So this storm you can see here, this is a hurricane Dorian here for this example. Uh, and you can see this, oops, you can see this code BT areas in the blue and white, they are the uh, represent the storm areas. So this just give you an idea of what the data look like. And we, we collected a lot of these observation and model forecast data. And then we stratified the data into a few groups according to their temperature. So we look at the different groups, mean BT values. Then we will notice if you look at this code, code end, this, in this group, we can see the model, which is the solid line, is consistently is a little bit warmer than the observation, showing the model forecast, the brightness temperature may have a warm bias in the cold temperature areas. So this can also be seen from the PDF, the probability density function. Here is the PDF for the full spectrum and we focus on this cold end. So this, this is only the tail of the PDF, but uh, as we can see in this early slide, this cold areas, they only occupy a small proportion of the domain, but they are important because they represent where the storms may be. So from this PDF, we can also see the model, which is this black line, is shifted to the warm side compared with the observation, also showing this warm model focus bias in the cold PT areas. So can we see this bias in our examples? So to highlight, to highlight the cold areas, we in this example, this is the example you saw earlier, and uh, we only plotted the code, code end. So you can see, this is a hurricane Doreen, hurricane Doreen simulation. Uh, but if you compare here, the observation brightness temperature has a very cold area here, I think it's the tropical storm Fernand, but in the model it's, uh, missing, maybe dissipated. And also here, you see some structures in the observed BT that's missing here. And here, uh, you see the temperature is colder than here. And the, the PDF for this storm only, we can see the, also we can see the model is shifted to the warm side, the same bias we see. And uh, 
Another example, this is a non-hurricane example. Uh, this is in July 2019. So from the PDF, we can clearly see this bias again. And from this snapshot, we can see here, there are a lot of uh, uh, code errors, but in the model, the model simulated there is smaller and less code. And also this structure, the model simulation of this structure is smaller. So this example is from the model result using GFS version 15.2 on uh, uh, the grid of the C384. I believe that's 25 kilometers grid. And this, this example is from uh, GFS V15.1 on a higher resolution grade 768. So to, to further confirm this bias, because sometimes one data source may be unreliable. So we also look at uh, another data site, that's the NASA series. Uh, C C E R E S. So this data set include uh, the top of atmosphere IR radiative flux data. So this variable is closely related to the brightness temperature. So we want to confirm the bias uh, from this NASA data too. So similarly, we we collected a lot of this model and. Uh, uh, NASA series data, we looked at the data from June to October. So we also stratified the data into different groups. And we can see actually the model did a pretty good job uh, simulating, forecasting the radiative flux. But if we look at this code in again, in the code in the model and the observation, they are uh, well correlated. They go up and down together, but we can see that there is a, a consistent, consistent bias from the model uh, output. It's a, also a warm bias. So both the NASA goals are brightness temperature and the NASA NASA's uh, radiative flux data confirm this model's code bias, I mean, warm bias in the code areas. So now the question is, uh, what may be the problems in the physics schemes that have caused this problem, caused this bias? So to answer that question, we did a sensitivity analysis. For this sensitivity analysis, we run the uh, single column model with CCPP physics provided by GMTB DTC. So we run 12 cases. Uh, the 12 cases are also provided by DTC with the release. So for each case, we make a lot of runs and each run we give a perturbation to the parameters. Here the parameter is defined as the tendency of x in physics schemes y and the x include the temperature, QV, UV, and the hydrometers. And the y, the scheme we looked includes macrophysics, convection, radiation, and PBL. So we make a lot of runs and we output our interested output variable. In this case, it's the top of atmosphere radiative flux because uh, the brightness temperature cannot be uh, processed. The, the single column model does not output the brightness temperature yet. So we look at this radiative flux. So after we make a lot of runs and we output the radiative flux, we use a statistics software. It's called Problem Solving Environment for Uncertainty Analysis and Design Exploration. So the idea is this software will help analyze 
uh, this output, our interested output, is mostly sensible to what parameters? So the result is uh, plotted at the scatter plot x-axis, is the normalized sensitivity, the y-axis is the standard deviation of the sensitivity. So uh, in the software, a general rule is if you have one parameter that's closer to this right upper corner, then it's more important than if the parameter is close to this corner. So anyway, three minutes, three minutes? oh sorry, okay. So anyway, the, uh, the sensitivity analysis shows there is uh, two parameters that is very important to, to this radiative flux. That's the temperature and the water vapor forecasting in the cumulus convection scheme. So this makes sense because imagine if the storm, the convection storm cannot develop high enough then it will not be able to show at the cold brightness temperature or the radiative flux. So this lead to a hypothesis. So the model bias of under predicting the coldness of brightness temperature and the radiative flux is likely because of uh, insufficient convective storm development. So the cloud cannot reach high to test this idea, we designed some experiments. So we go into the physics schemes and uh, uh, give the, the model of extra heating. So we uh, had a, a extra positive heating part, sensible heating and uh, latent heating to the physics schemes. We'll see if this modification will help reduce the bias. If it did, then maybe the hypothesis is correct. So uh, the model we used here is GFS V15.2 on this 25 kilometer grid. So we tested these two cases you saw earlier. Okay, here we show this PDF. First of all, we notice that on this uh, 25 kilometer grid, we also have this bias. So this PDF, this red one is observed and the purple one is the control one without any modification. And we can see when we add the extra heating term to this model runs, the actually the model focus of BT, this output is brightness temperature. So the BT is clo is become closer to the observation. So the bias is reduced. And if we add this extra heating to both convection and the microphysics schemes, we can see more, uh, more improvement. And this, when we add 3%, 5%, 7 9%, and this, uh, Forecast the brightness temperature PDF is become much closer to the observation. And if we look at the the actual forecast the examples here, we we saw this earlier. This is a Hurricane Doreen and this Fernand is missing in the control room. But when we add this extra heating, we can see uh, this tropical storm is simulated pretty well, and also this model now can pick up these structures, which is also missing in the uh, control runs. And here is the, the second example, the July one, non hurricane case. And we can see with this extra heating, uh, we have more larger, larger areas of the cold areas than the control run here. And also this structure this structure is become bigger than here. So uh, both the PDF and the, the examples show the improvement of this focus of granite temperature after we give it some extra heating. So this kind of confirmed 
this hypothesis that maybe the model has some problem uh, related to the microphysics and the convection that cause it to under predict the storm development that caused the bias. And we also tested this experiments on a coarse grid. So here it's a 50 kilometer grid. And uh, the result is kind of surprising because you see when you add some extra heating, the storms become so then very large. If you look at this PDF, uh, the red is observation and the purple is control. You see, when we add extra heating, the PDF is closer to the observation, but then it passed the observation. And now the warm bias become a cold bias. So we need to understand why these different resolutions respond so differently to this heating metaphysics and the convection schemes. And similarly, here is a 100 kilometer run. We also see this problem of this PDF uh, turning from a warm bias to a cold bias. So with that, here's my summary. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, a lot of people to thank. Great. Thank you, thank, thank you, Xiao, for your great uh, presentation. Unfortunately, you use up all the time for your talk and uh, we have to move on, but we do see questions from the Slack channel. I encourage you to interact with uh, uh, the uh, questions and, and people there. And thank I you will. so much again for your great presentation. Now, you. Our next, or the last speaker of this session is Dan uh, Domico. Uh, he's talking about evaluating model physics in the UFS and uh, using the uh, CCPP single color model. Uh, here you go, Dan. I will do the same exercise to remind you 10 minutes uh, into your talk. Okay, uh, thanks, Lulin. Um, yes, today we will be talking about using the CCPP single column model to evaluate uh, model physics in the UFS. Uh, I wanna start by thanking all of my co-authors uh, for all the hard work they put into this, particularly the lead author, uh, Weiwei, who gave part one of this physics evaluation talk yesterday in the um, evaluation parallel section. Uh, so we're going to jump right into it by looking at the three models that we used for this study, and we start with the UFS, medium range weather application, at C768 horizontal resolution with 64 vertical levels. And we ran this uh, for June 11th, 2016, uh, a 72-hour forecast, but we only used the first 15 hours of that forecast to match better with our lasso, which are uh, large eddy simulations that took place over the atmospheric radiation measurement Southern Great Plains site near Lamont, Oklahoma. And the date was selected because of the high total cloud skill score. So in the very high vertical resolution of uh, large eddy simulations combined with the dense observations of the super site, uh, we use lasso as truth in our investigation. And actually this is a pretty common practice in single column model studies. And so that does bring us to our single column model, which was driven by lasso uh, inputs. So that was multi-scale data assimilation for the atmosphere and variational analysis for the land surface. Um, and because this single column model is essentially constrained by what you can call observations, uh, the bias identified with the single column model can mainly be attributed to the developmental uh, GFS version 16 beta suite of physical parameterizations, which will be our main, um, our main focus for this talk. And so here we have plotted, or um, here we have shown all of the models and physical parameterizations that we used for this study. We're only gonna focus on the high points. So we'll start with the UFS, which contains the full 16 beta suite of physics with the NOAA land surface model, which is highlighted in red here. Uh, at current, at this current time, the single column model cannot utilize a land surface model because of some initial condition issues. So surface heat fluxes need to be prescribed. And that brings us to our first experiment, which is called control. And this has the full 16 beta suite of physics with surface heat flux is prescribed from the UFS. So we ran the UFS model and plug that into our single column model initial conditions. 
Uh, our second experiment is test one, which has the full 16 beta suite of physics with surface heat fluxes prescribed with the variational analysis. And this variational analysis drives the land surface in the lasso. So you can also call these lasso heat fluxes if you're inclined to do so. And our final experiment, test two, also has the lasso surface heat fluxes, but instead of the full 16 beta suite of physics, we've actually replaced the TKE-based uh, eddy diffusivity mass flux PVL scheme with the MYNN scheme. And Joe Olson gave a great talk on the MYNN PBL scheme on Monday afternoon. Uh, and the PBL will be another uh, primary focus of this, of this particular study. And we'll begin by looking at the UFS and how it performed against LASSO. And we'll start with pro vertical profiles of thermodynamics. So these are two hour time averages. Mm -hmm. I should also mention the time that, the, uh, that we ran the simulations or at least analyzed the simulations. Uh, we started at 6 Central Standard Time on June 11th and completed at 21 Central Standard Time. So these are two-hour time averages. Uh, so this 0900 would actually be 700 to 900. Uh, this 1100 would be 900 to 1100, and so on. Solid lines represent the lasso, and the dashed lines represent UFS. And uh, on top, we have plotted potential temperature, and on the bottom, water vapor specific humidity, or QV. And the main takeaway from this slide is that the PBL simulated by the UFS is notably cooler and drier throughout the simulation. There are some other interesting structures that we see, particularly in the potential temperature, uh, that we want to time to discuss in this talk today. Looking deeper into the biases uh, from the UFS against the last, so we have plotted time height plots of uh, anomalies in potential temperature, QV, U, and V winds. Um, and so we start by looking at the theta, and we see the majority of the planetary boundary layer with our UFS is colder uh, than our lasso, so that confirms what we saw in our vertical profiles. And with some exceptions, when we look at QV, our moisture is also mainly drier in our PBL, again, with a few, sorry about that, with a few uh, exceptions. Looking at the anomalies in the wind, so the colors are going to be the anomalies, and overlaid on top of that are the lasso U and V winds, respectively. And we'll start looking at these by examining the lasso uh, contours, which are again in the black. Um, looking at this U wind, it, it's a little difficult to see the numbers on here, but this is the zero meter per second contour. And so, despite U and V both being uh, vector uh, vector quantities and not scalar quantities, this zero meter per second contour tells us that these very bright colors we're seeing in the PBL in the afternoon and nearing the end of the simulation are uh, the result of overmixing. For the V-wind, we see this is the five meter per second contour, this is the four meter per second, and this is three meter per second. So again, the bright colors are a sign that we're overmixing. Also, if we look back to the U-winds, uh, we have this very strong positive anomaly. Uh, which indicates a strong westerly bias as well. So some of these biases that we're seeing can be attributed to the advection that the UFS is simulating. Looking at diurnal cycles of surface and PBL parameters, um, each plot has an orange line that represents the lasso and a solid black line that represents the UFS simulation. Uh, on the top left, we have air temperature at two meters. Top middle, we have the sensible heat flux at the surface. Top right, we have the surface latent heat flux. Bottom left, we have the 10 meter wind speeds. And in the bottom middle, we have the calculated planetary boundary layer height. So if we look at the two meter air temperature and to a certain extent, the sensible heat flux at the surface, those are offset somewhat diurnally uh, compared to the lasso. And we also see that both the sensible and latent heat fluxes are much larger uh, for, our, for our UFS than our lasso. Despite our PBL mainly being cooler for our lasso, or excuse me, for our UFS, we actually see that our UFS surface temperatures are warmer than lasso throughout the day, uh, which does match fairly well with what we see in our fluxes. Looking at the wind speeds, and this is just wind speed, this is not a vector quantity here. There are a few hours early in the simulation where the lasso is faster than the UFS in terms of the wind speed, but we can see late in the simulation 
uh, distinctly faster wind speeds for the UFS. And finally, looking at our PVL evolution throughout the day, we see, sorry about that, we see that during the afternoon hours when convection would start to get going at its peak, the UFS, despite being cooler, has a deeper boundary layer uh, than the lasso. And it also begins to stabilize earlier and not quite as quickly uh, as the lasso. Uh, and we have that distinct overmixing pattern where we have a deeper UFS PBL by the end of the simulation. And this PBL, uh, this PBL prediction is, matches the flux predictions fairly well. So moving on to the single column model test, which will give us a better idea of what our physics are doing, uh, we'll start by just looking at our biases. Uh, again, these are time height plots of biases. And just as a reminder, the control experiment featured our UFS, apologies, our UFS surface fluxes. Uh, test one had our full 16 beta suite with lasso fluxes, and test two had our MYNN PBL. And uh, on top, we have the potential temperature. And we can see a very strong control of the land surface leading to this very warm bias in our potential temperature. Uh, for our control experiment. With test one, where we start to actually constrain those surface fluxes with observations, the warm bias has diminished, but it certainly has not disappeared. Uh, so there is still a warm bias present. We move to our MYNN and our test two, we see an actual, uh, a, a fairly good representation of the planetary boundary layer, uh, most of it agreeing with the lasso. On the bottom, we have the QV, and the representation of the boundary, uh, excuse me, the simulation of the boundary layer by the single column models for test one and control are, are both fairly good. There is a slight wet bias uh, just below PBL top and then a dry bias above that. Uh, we look to our test two, which again had the MYNN PBL. That dry bias has expanded quite a bit. And I'll, I'll cover this a little bit more in, in a few slides why this dry bias is here. Three minutes. Yes, yeah, so we're going to go quickly through this next slide. Um, these are the anomalies in the U and V winds. Thank you, Lulin. Uh, these are the anomalies in the U and V winds for each single column model experiment. And remember that our lasso winds for U and V were relatively light in our PBL, particularly late in the sim simulation. So the bright colors we're seeing here are also an indication that we're seeing uh, some overmixing with our single column model experiments. So finally, looking into the evolution of our boundary layer, um, each plot has an orange line that represents lasso, and that is the same for all three plots. And the black line is going to be the individual single column model experiments. So with our control and with test one, during the afternoon when we have convection, we see that uh, deeper boundary layer, which makes sense given that we're warmer and at least slightly overmixed. But when we change our boundary layer scheme, well, as we did in test two to the MYNN, we have a much better prediction of the PBL uh, during those afternoon hours. Um, so the MYNN PBL gave us, gave us some, some good indications that it's handling the PBL height fairly well. Now, one thing I haven't touched on that has an impact on the evolution of the boundary layer is the, are the, the simulation of clouds. So here we have the cloud fraction uh, simulated for each of our experiments and the lasso here on the far left. In the lasso, we had a few hours of very light cloud cover throughout the day. And remember, lasso had a very high cloud skill score. So we have a good, good confidence in this being fairly accurate. Control and test one only have this cloud cover for maybe an hour to two hours. And when we shift our PBL scheme, as we did in test two, we do get a better temporal simulation of the clouds, but now we're actually starting to over predict our cloud fraction. Uh, another thing that I'm not going to show here, uh, in these first hours of simulation uh, for each single column model test, we did receive some, uh, uh, sorry about that, uh, a very brief pulse of light precipitation, and this was not forecasted, or excuse me, simulated by the lasso. Uh, so this precipitation is, is going to have impacts on the uh, evolution of our boundary layer. So this brings into the question, into question uh, how the convection is handling the clouds 
in addition to how the radiation is picking up on the precipitation. So to summarize and kind of tie everything back together, remember our UFS boundary layer was generally cold and dry with greater wind speeds. And these cool dry biases are mainly due to large scale evection with our UFS. Uh, where these errors originated, that's more of a question. Uh, well, it's a question that needs to be examined that we haven't quite gotten to just yet. Our full 16 beta suite of physics generates a warmer PBL. Uh, so maybe a little bit more control of our land surface uh, when we have our full 16 beta suite of physics. And we also, with our full 16 beta suite of physics, have that lack of PBL clouds. Um, so perhaps our PBL and radiation schemes aren't working together well, and our convection scheme might also be playing a role in what we're seeing with our simulations. And that is uh, what I have for you today. I thank you for your attention. And if there's time, uh, I will gladly answer some questions. Yeah, thank you, Dan, for the great uh, presentation. We do have time for one or two questions. Uh, Evan, I will hand, uh, I'll let you handle that. Okay, uh, first we have a question from Phil Pajone. He says, Dan, I like the use of the LES and SCM in diagnosing the physics schemes, but how difficult is it to do this for different regions or weather regimes? For example, a tropical convective region or over the Arctic? Uh, well, if you have, I, so really with these single column model and large eddy simulations, um, for diagnosing physics schemes, you really do need to have data. And that becomes very difficult when you're talking about places over the Arctic. There are studies that do exist. Um, eventually, uh, as my postdoc continues, hopefully we can get some of these studies into, this, into the CCPP single column model. Um, if you have the data and the data is formatted correctly, it, it, it isn't all that difficult speaking from experience now i'm not speaking from everyone's experience just my own personal experience um so that's that's kind of where i would stand on that as long as the data is there um, you, you would be able to use it great um maybe we have another comment from Fanling and evan after that we can uh, adjourn Okay, so Fanglin's comment is, in the final configuration of GFS version 16, we further updated the PBL scheme and reduced the cold bias in summer. The use of the new scale-aware TKE EDMF scheme reduced the large cold bias in winter that was found in GFS version 15. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that great comment. And I think we run out of time of this session. And thank you everybody for participating this session. And due to some difficulty, technical difficulty, we still have uh, six minutes past the uh, supposedly uh, end time. But I would like to take the chance to thank all the organizers, the Weiwei and Catherine and Evan, Jeff and everybody else uh, for the great work to put together. So please welcome uh, coming back in 24 minutes for the next session. Uh, Catherine, do you have anything you want to announce? Um, I don't have anything, just that we'll return after the break. Um, unless So we're going to leave this meeting uh, here, and then uh, but people can join the meeting on the link from the website, right? Yep, same as yesterday. You can stay on. We'll leave it hooked in. Um, but if you drop off, you can rejoin. Great. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. I will just applaud for everyone, and thanks for all the support from the uh, organizing party. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Bye.
Hi, everyone. This is Tara um, Jensen. I'm going to be moderating. Um, I have uh, elevated all of the um, presenters um, to the level of panelists. Do any of you want to practice sharing your screen? I'd like to try it. Okay, Paul, I will elevate you to presenter. Okay. I'm passing it over to you as presenter. Ooh, good thing we did this. Pop up I, have to, I have to allow some permissions, apparently. I'd like to right. take a shot once Paul's done. Yeah, in order to allow the permissions, I'm going to have to quit and start again. So maybe go ahead and, and I'll I'll try later. Okay, sounds good. All right, so Ben, I'm going to now make you the presenter. Yay, we can see your stuff. You're good to go. Can you hear me talk? Uh, yes, Jessica, we can hear you. Do you want to try and be presenter? Sure. Okay, I'm making you presenter right now. Should be passing over to you now. Awesome. Yeah, we can see your slides. Um, Perfect. That works. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Great. All right. Um, Sean or, or Paul, do you want to try again? I'm here. Okay. Okay. I let me see the controls. Yes, we can see your screen. Excellent, thank you. Show the full screen. Yep, there you go. All right, All right. great. And Paul, Paul, I am working on repanalyzing you and, and making you a presenter to try, okay? All right, so I made you a panelist, and now I'm going to go ahead and make you all. Um, okay. And hopefully it'll work better. Passing it yeah. over to you. All right. Okay, looks like I got options now. Okay. Let me see. Hmm. Okay, that's the screen and then get some of the stuff out the way. Yep, we can see it, that's good. And now is that the wrong, I've got to swap displays, right? Yeah, you got to swap display. Okay, and now is that right? Perfect, Mundo. All right, cool. Great, Thank great you. Paul. And then, um, Stacy, uh, as the chair, um, I, I've seen that you've arrived and I went ahead and, and um, promoted you as well. Okay, so um, I have to ask um, uh, the, the, um, the attendees to, to raise their hand, the participants to raise their hand. So just so you know, Stacy, I've already 
them on. I, I've already moved all of them over um, okay. and checked to make sure that they all present. So I think we're in good shape. You can kind of just relax for another eight minutes and get ready to rock and roll. Okay, so does, is there anything else that I need to say um, other than to um, say their names, who is presenting? Do I need to give a, um, introduce them as like <laughs> a back background on them or anything? No, um, typically what what I, I've been doing is um, introducing them, uh, reading off their affiliation and reading off the title of their um, talk. Mm -hmm. um, shared um and then at the beginning also point out um we need to be put i want to put it in the chat as well but putting the questions into the earth system modeling slack mm -hmm. channel okay and then just kind of monitoring time and making sure that they stay on schedule okay and also um the the, the slide that you're showing now is not the first one that's coming up because i'm seeing no. here okay good yeah, no, I'll I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to Jessica. We were okay. just checking to make sure everybody could present. So, Jessica, I'm passing it over to you if you want to go ahead and accept and, and okay. have it sitting there.
Okay, I think we should be ready to get started now. It's 1230. First, we're going to be, oops, just a minute. First session that we're talking about is the development of a fully coupled UFS based system, science formulation of seasonal to season, sub seasonal prototypes. Jessica Mexner, Mexner sorry if I pronounced it wrong. Um, will be presenting. I want to um, just let everyone know that you do have 15 minutes. So I will be giving you a warning um, for the time at about 13 minutes through. So Jessica, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Stacey. Um, so I'm Jessica Meixner. I work at EMC. And today I'm going to be um, telling you about our development process um, for our S2S uh, prototypes. So first, I would like to start out by thanking all of my co-authors, but not just um, the co-authors listed here, uh, but all of the contributors um, to this project. Um, without our um, collaborators and all of the contributions from our colleagues at Ezra and Nessie, GFDL, and UCAR, this would not be possible. So thank you all very much. So here at um, the Weather Service, our um, end goal and motivation is an operational target. And so the first one for uh, the S2S prototypes that we're talking about the development of today is for the Global Ensemble Forecasting System version 13. And so we'll be hoping to improve upon uh, GEFS version 12, for example, uh, addressing maybe the weak MJO amplitudes that BJ mentioned yesterday um, for version 12. And then in the future also for the SFS. So the model that we'll be uh, talking about today is the UFS S2S model, which can be found on GitHub. So right now it's a four-way coupled model. Our atmospheric model has the FE3 dynamical core uh, we're using the GFS physics with the GFDL microphysics, and now we're using the CCPP physics driver, the FE3 GFS uh, version 15P2 coupled uh, suite definition. It's the C384 resolution with 64 layers. The ocean model is MOM6. Uh, it's the quarter degree tripolar grid with 75 hybrid levels. We're using the OM4 setup, which you can find a description of um, by Alistair and others at the link there. And for the ICE model, we're using SICE 5, the Los Alamos sea ice model. Um, in the future, we'll move to SICE 6. We're also using that same quarter degree tripolar grid, and we're not using the mushy thermodynamics. We have recently added the wave model. So that's WaveWatch 3, Right now, we're using a half degree regular lat one grid and the ST4 physics package, which is the physics that are used operationally uh, for multi one and in guest version 12 and the future GFS version 16 for the wave model. So we're using the NIMS driver and most of the previous, all of the previous uh, prototypes um, that we've already done are using the NIMS mediator. But moving forward, we'll be using the community mediator CMIPS that Denise talked about on Monday. And so um, a prototype is just a snapshot in time of this coupled model. And then we run um, a benchmark um, set of runs. So that is 168 35 day free forecasts. And the reasoning behind this is that we need a small enough uh, set of runs that is computationally feasible to do multiple of these, but also um, is large enough that it gives us a statistical, um, a good statistical sample, and also really exercises the model. So both El Nino and La Nina and years of low ice extent. So one way that you can kind of mark time through our prototypes, um, one through four here, um, some of them have multiple, and so we'll call them like 3.1, is the different initial conditions that we use. So starting out, um, we did not have the wave model, 
and we use CFSR initial conditions for all three of the components. However, the ocean only had temperature and salinity for the initial condition. And so Travis Luca um, from CPC, or at the time was at CPC, and ran a 3D VAR um, simulation that gave us um, initial conditions that also included the currents. So that was in prototype two. And then in the prototype three, we transitioned to using the CPC ice analysis uh, for the ice initial conditions. And then in prototype four, we had the addition of the wave model, um, which has initial conditions just from a standalone CFS forced uh, simulation. So as we have um, gone through these series of prototypes in our development process, um, we have always updated um, the code to keep up with the latest um, develop branches of the various component repositories and have definitely fixed bugs along the way. So these are not um, strictly comparative. So you just see you know, the update from the initial conditions. And so here's a summary of the major updates, um, more from the science side of um, as we've gone along. So the first P1 was our first initial prototype. Prototype two, as we talked about, we have that improved ocean initial condition. We also um, have slow fast coupling time steps were updated um, to be more consistent um, with the formulation of the coupling. Um, not mentioned here, we also use the MOM6 unified cap. In 3.1, we again have um, updated initial conditions, this time for ice. Uh, river runoff was added from climatology uh, for the ocean model as an input. And the fluxes from the ice model are no longer merged in the mediator with fluxes um, from the ocean on icy points, so points that have both open water and ice. Uh, prototype four is our most recent uh, prototype. Um, the major updates there were that we have added um, wave coupling, which we'll talk more about in a minute. And we also moved from the IPD physics driver to the CCPP physics driver. And we are now currently in preparation for 4.1, and that will transition and be the first uh, prototype with the CMIPS mediator, which we're really excited about. And um, in prototype four, we also discovered some issues with the wave atmospheric coupling, and so those will be fixed as well. So what is our current configuration? Here we show a schematic of um, kind of the basic communication between the components. So you'll see that the atmosphere, ocean, and ice all communicate to each other from the, with the mediator. However, the wave model is uh, connected to each of the other components through direct connectors. And this is all being driven by the NIMS driver. So some details about um, the exchange of information the atmosphere ice fluxes are computed by the ice model, and then the atmosphere ocean fluxes are computed by the atmospheric model. Currently, our atmosphere and ocean grids, their land sea masks do not match. Um, so the SST, when it's interpolated from the ocean to the atmosphere, is first interpolated using a conservative method and then nearest neighbor fill is used to uh, fill in any remaining points. And then we as we said, um, prototype four, our major update is the wave model. So uh, for coupling with the wave model, the wave model will receive the 10 meter winds from the atmosphere, currents from the ocean, and ice concentration. In return, the wave model will send the Z0 roughness length back to the atmosphere. And the motivation for this is we have seen in other couple models um, that you can particularly have improvements in stormy regions. So if you have a hurricane, um, other centers have shown uh, skill score improvements by including this uh, feedback. And then for the ocean model, we will send Stokes drift. And this is so that we can have a C state dependent Langmuir mixing. 
And all of the previous uh, benchmarks, be prototypes before prototype four, we had a parameterized Langmuir mixing. And so it was just based on the wind speed. However, now we will have a C state dependent Langmuir mixing. And the reason that you wanna include Langmuir mixing is that it's very common for all coupled models to have too shallow of a mixed layer depth in the Southern Ocean. But by including Langmuir mixing, you can improve upon that. So um, later others are gonna um, go more in depth into the evaluation, but just kind of a summary of what we have um, achieved as we've gone along. So for prototype one, there was no uh, tuning of the coupled model as it was put together. Um, so this was just each of these components um, coupled and without tuning, we got a skill that was comparable, if not better to operational CFS both globally and over CONUS. Um, but we got significantly better skill um, in for ice forecasts. So that's um, one of the benefits of our new coupled system um, that might be uh, just attributed to the fact that we do have higher resolution over the ice regions, um, but we also have um, a newer ice model as well. Uh, for prototype two, um, that improved um, ocean initial condition, um, improved our SST scores. However, we were um, similar in the atmosphere. And then prototype three, where the major um, change was the ice initial conditions, we saw um, improvement in the ice area in our forecasts. And for prototype four, our motivation is to improve our air-sea interactions um, by having the sea state dependent roughness length and wing mirror mixing. And as we have gone through prototype four, uh, we noticed that there was the issue for wave atmospheric coupling. And so we are working on improving that um, and looking forward to uh, prototype 4.1. So as um, we continue to move on, uh, we have a series of prototypes planned. So there will always be bug fixes and improvements um, that come in. But these are the main planned improvements for um, prototypes five through eight. So after 4.1, we'll do prototype five, which will um, include switching out size five for size six. We will also um, use the improvement for the fractional grid that our colleagues at uh, GSL have implemented so that we can have conservation um, and no more uh, land sea mask issues or mismatch between the atmosphere and the ocean. For prototype six, we'll be moving from the GFS 15.2 to using the GFS version 16 physics and going from the 64 to 127 layers or levels. Uh, prototype seven, our initial conditions will come from the Marine DA, so the Soka Jedi or hybrid Godaz project. And we'll also be looking at um, including other components such as a uh, land model. And lastly, in prototype eight, we will be looking at uh, physics tuning um, once we have all of the components in the coupled model. And uh, for more details, I invite you to see Lydia's presentation at 220 um, about the evaluation of all of these S2S prototypes. And then John Day at 3.30 will give a more in-depth view of the ocean state for our UFS model. And I am happy to take questions if there is any time. Well, we have one minute left and um, we're gonna um, be taking questions in the Slack channel, the Earth System Modeling Slack channel. So thank you, Jessica, for that. Next yeah. oh, I don't see any questions right now. Yeah. Okay. Jessica, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So next we have um, Benjamin Cash improving the project update, improving week three, four weather prediction through a global con um, convection, allowing version of the NOAA unified coupled modeling framework. 
doing. All right. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me and see my slides? We can see your slides and hear you. Okay, great. All yours. All right. Well, thank you very much. Let's see. Will my slides advance? Hey, there we go. Okay. So before uh, getting started, I'd just like to have some, um, some acknowledgments. Uh, we've made quite a bit of progress in this project, and it would not have been possible without uh, generous donations of time and effort by a number of people uh, listed here. Uh, I always dread making a list like this because inevitably, as soon as you put it up, you realize you've left somebody crucial off. So many thanks to everybody and my apologies in advance to whoever it is that I've left out. Uh, to give an overview of our project, the hypothesis that we are interested in testing is that poorly resolved cumulus convection can degrade global forecast at all lead times. And the follow on to that is the question of whether or not we can improve subseasonal or S2S forecasts by enhancing the resolution of the global atmosphere component in UFS uh, to convection allowing scales. There's quite a bit of previous work in theory to suggest the answer to this question is yes. Uh, we've done something similar in the past with other models where we've increased spatial resolution and improved uh, elements of S2S prediction skill. This was in collaboration with ECMWF using their model. And it also makes sense from a theoretical standpoint because major drivers of S2S variability depend on the organization, extent, intensity, frequency, many characteristics of deep convection. This is particularly true in the tropics, uh, MJO, the MISOs, and so teleconnections uh, all depend on organized deep convection. And the deficiencies in the subgrid scale parameterizations could easily mask the benefits of increasing resolution. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're interested in seeing what happens as we increase. In order to test this hypothesis, we plan to run a series of subseasonal ensemble reforecast experiments using three different configurations of a global Earth system model, namely the UFS coupled system that we just heard about. One of them is global NWP, so going up to the 768 in the atmosphere or 13 kilometers, then testing the 3072, the three and a half kilometers globally, and finally a nested or stretch grid uh, set of experiments just focused on tropical convection. So using the convection allowing in the tropics and NWP outside of the tropics. And the format of these experiments follows uh, suggestions were made by Weber and Mass in 19. In order to evaluate this, we're gonna look at differences in the week three to four forecast skill for precip and two meter temperature and over conus. We're interested not only in the means, but the potential for extreme outlooks and also the relative contribution of better local cumulus uh, parameterizations, cumulus representation versus the influence of teleconnections. So I guess it was in November that uh, Jim Kinter gave an update on our status to a group like this, where we had ported um, the UFS S2S model that we just heard about again, using specifically we were using the CMEPS mediator. This was the 0.5 tag of that code. Uh, we don't have access to NOAA uh, HPC resources to do these runs, so we're using community uh, exceed resources, particularly Cheyenne and Stampede 2. This port was done in uh, collaboration with the group at NCAR, so many thanks to them. We were able to run a four component system using the CMEPS mediator, and we also had MET and MET Plus. Uh, for looking at the output. So thanks to Julie for helping us with that. We had resources on Stampede 2 to do some of the NWP type runs. In-house, we had developed a bunch of Python-based workflow modules in order to generate um, the atmospheric and oceanic initial conditions using outside sources. We're using CFS for atmosphere land, ocean sea ice with plans to go to other data products um, as well. So we're taking existing reanalyses here and interpolating them. We're not trying to do our own full up data assimilation. We don't have the resources either or expertise uh, to, to do that on this project. We'd also uh, developed some workflow modules to post-process and visualize the atmosphere ocean uh, forecast output. 
And one of the things that came out of this is we actually found an, a limitation in ESM Pi for regridding tripolar grids as a result of this work, which we notified people about, and that's been addressed in the most recent ESMF release. So if you've ever made a plot that had an irritating seam in a tripolar grid, a regridded tripolar grid across the poles, uh, that should be fixed. And this is sort of a theme I'll keep coming back to uh, in this talk. So as of November, this is where we were. We we're going through CMEPs, the different model components, a couple of different initial data sources, uh, no chemistry, and we are not using a uh, waves component. <clears throat> so how have we done since then? We have now made multiple integrations using, again, S2S. Now we're on the CMEP 0.6 tag on Cheyenne. A uh, special thanks to Denise for her patience and expertise in getting us running there. We made a set of five-day integrations initialized in Ju January and July for the period 2011 to 2019. This configuration, we're using CCPP. And we managed to do it at both 384 and the 768 atmospheric resolution, which I think is new for the S2S. I don't think that had been done before. And we've saved hourly output using the Gaussian grid net CDF option in, F in the UFS. We've expanded our workflow modules to create new initial conditions, including from the FV3 reanalysis, uh, which was set up to do this sort of thing. So we we're happy to use that. And the Aura S5 for sea ice and ocean. We also had, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I created what I called a workflow of necessity using Silk um, because managing all of the nameless changes and in input files uh, by hand was just too cumbersome and error prone to do at scale for uh, the number of runs we wanted to do. Unfortunately, if you remember one of my earlier slides, our production resources are on Stampede 2, not on Cheyenne. So this is not uh, sustainable for our project. So we need to get the code on to Stampede 2. And so this is definitely hot off the presses as of yesterday and this morning, the port of UFS S2S to uh, Stampede 2 is complete. Uh, in doing so, we leveraged the SEAM infrastructure and the extensive work that was done for the medium range weather public release. We tried building it ourselves uh, for quite a while via the compile.sh option. There were too many missing configuration files. We couldn't get it to work. I want to say a special thanks here to Jim Edwards and Ariana Bertenstein at NCAR for very generous donation of their time and effort to get us moving again. This was really not their problem to solve. Um, but they helped us out because we were stuck and not going anywhere. As a bonus for them, we, in this process, uncovered a minor MOM6 seam interface issue, which they were able to fix. And as another bonus for me personally, uh, I can then deprecate my homegrown silk workflow, uh, which was satisfying since I'm leading a workflow coordination effort and I'm trying to make them more similar as opposed to adding to the workflow explosion. In this process, we updated to size six. So we're now running size six at Stampede 2. This will allow a more flexible PE uh, configuration, <coughs> which will help us out quite a bit. And the science results should be similar, although apparently not as similar as were expected. So that's something that people are uh, looking into. And we also, uh, by doing this, picked up some other updates, to some of the other components since the 0 0.6 tag. And uh, my test runs are sitting in the queue as of the time of putting this slide together, which is unfortunately sort of the natural state of jobs on Stampede 2. So we've gone from here at our last update to this, where we have now upgraded the model components. We've added in uh, different data sources. We've picked up you know, a big step in our ultimate goal of 3072 in terms of a resolution. And uh, we've gone to size six. Still no waves component. We're still looking into that, partly because of the issues Julian just mentioned. So I'm only going to touch very briefly on the science that we've uh, done with these runs. Uh, I'm just going to show a couple of examples. This is the surface temperature from one of the runs that we did. Uh, and anybody who's looking at this plot with a critical eye is probably wondering what on earth is wrong with my color palette. Uh, since you can't really see any features. But if you've really been paying attention, you'll look down here and seen that my color scale is bottoming out at zero Kelvin. So what on earth is going on here? 
probably cannot see this on your screens, but if you focus in on this area, there are a few blue dots. So we're going to zero in on this and see what has happened. It turns out as you close in, let's see if I can get my pointer back, over some of these large inland uh, water bodies, the temperatures are crashing out to zero in a few cases. And you can see that this effect is detectable in pixels around the water body. And we can also, I'm not showing this, you can also see it in the two meter temperatures. So it's not just a diagnostic problem. The model is really doing this. So we uh, found this, we uh, reported it back to Denise who took a look at it. And uh, I believe it was determined this was a, a real issue in CMEPs that has been subsequently addressed. And the point that I wanted to make here is the problem was present in some of the existing EMC prototype runs, but it just hadn't been spotted. Uh, not because anybody was being careless, just because you always have in a project like this, you have more data than eyeballs. You know, there's just not enough human power to go around to look at all of the things that could be happening in all of these cases. And I think this is sort of illustrates a real strength of the community approach. The more people you have looking, uh, the better the models will be, the more things we find like this. Uh, so in summary, uh, we've made quite a bit of progress in meeting some pretty ambitious goals, project goals since November. We can generate initial conditions from data sources of our choosing at multiple resolutions, from multiple platforms. We've enhanced our post-processing and exploratory analysis. And we now have sufficient data and cases to do some interesting scientific analysis. You know, it wasn't just a one-off test run. We've got uh, spanning the annual cycle a little bit, spanning you know, interannual variability. And uh, Paul is going to talk more about this just a little bit later in the session. And the main thing I wanted to emphasize really is I feel like the community approach is already producing dividends and we're seeing it here. Uh, just in our work, we made incidental discoveries uh, in a variety of issues that have subsequently been addressed. We got a lot of help from outside of the project team. Uh, this really has been a village. Uh, and on that note, uh, if you happen to have nameless settings for 3072 for the global atmosphere, uh, please let me know. And uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Benjamin. OK, so we are on track. And um, the next is Shan. Do you, do you want to um, take any questions? Because there are some questions in Slack. Uh, I could always just hop over to the Slack and uh, talk with people there. OK, that's fine. Or, I just or wanted we can read them off. I'm, I'm fine either way. Um, well, one of the questions is already answered by Jim Kinter. Um, YJ Kim has a, a comment about S2S modeling. Um, and then there's some additional questions. Do you want the comment read right into um, this, Stacy? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm happy to just go engage on Slack. Okay. We can keep the ball rolling. Okay. Okay. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we have um, Shan Sun. Good. Okay. We can see your screen. If you are talking, we do not hear you yet. Can you hear me now? Can hear you now. Thank you. Great. So my talk today is about the direct effect of aerosols on subseasonal prediction with inline chemistry model in the UFS. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-author, Li Zhang, Hai Chin Li, George Guo, Rana Black, and Judy Henderson. It's truly a um, group effort. Uh, there have been a lot of talks at this workshop touching upon the, the GAFS aerosol model, 
as well as the importance of aerosol impact on weather and its challenge due to many uncertainties of aerosol impact, in, including direct and semi-direct effect, et cetera. In this study, we will focus on direct effect only as the first step, which is considered normally to be a negative impact on climate due to its uh, reflecting mechanism. Um, as we have heard in the past few days, GEF aerosol is a chemistry component based on WolfCam and using the aerosol modules from GoCard, and that is coupled to the FE3 GFS using new OPSI. And this model is going to be operational at NSEP very soon. So what we are using in this study, I called it FE3 GSL CAM, and it is based on GEF's aerosol chemical component except it uses CCPP, the Common Community Physics Package, instead of uh, the new OPSI. While the GEFS aerosol code is frozen for operational purpose, the CCPP version is still under development. So we use this um, um, model, this version of the model, and carry out four experiment. The first one is the control run, which does not have chemistry. It has prescribed background aerosols. And the next one is the one with the full chemistry and is prescribed the aerosol source and sink. It has anthropogenic emissions monthly and the biomass burnings, uh, which is daily. It also includes dust as well as sea salt. And the next experiment is we call no fire run that is identical to the full chemistry run, except there's no daily update in the biomass burning emissions. So literally the, the fire was used on the day one, which we which the initial condition we chose is May 1st and the, uh, does not change throughout the integration. And because of COVID-19, we added another experiment that we call the clean cam run that is identical to the full cam run, except all the anthropogenic emissions are reduced by 90% globally. So all this experiment, um, I mean, the rest of the, the last of three experiment has uh, only direct effect in the FE3 GFL cam. All the four experiments are carried out at one degree horizontal resolution and 64 vertical layers. Oh, we ran the case that started uh, from May 1st, 2020 and integrated for four months in order to capture the dust storm that happened late June. So, um, First of all, we like to look at the model output of the column integral of aerosols. Here is the comparison of, of the dust integral between GAF's aerosol 24-hour forecast that's on the upper left, which we use as the truth, and the one on the upper right is the two-month forecast from this FE3 GSL cam with the full chemistry. And uh, overall, the, the dust column integral are very similar to, uh, to each other, so that's a very good news. And in the bottom two panels, those are the no fire versus the 10% anthropogenic emissions and they don't affect the dust much. So they are pretty similar. I highlight those interest area in the red circles. So move on, everything here is the same uh, to the previous plot, except it is organic carbon. Again, the two month forecast with the um, 
FE3GS LCAM is similar to the GAFS aerosol, the 24 hour forecast, and the reduction in the column integral over Central and the South Africa is expected in the case of no fire. And next move on is the black carbon. Again, it tells a similar story in those areas. And in the case of 10% anthropogenic emission, which is in the lower right, we can see that the column integral is much weaker uh, over Asia compared to the full chemistry run. The next one is the column sulfate. Again, the two month forecast is similar to the GAFS aerosol. And, uh, and over East Asia, the column integral is much reduced in the 10% anthropogenic emission case. The last one is the sea salt column integral. The, uh, the two-month forecast is similar, again, to the 24-hour forecast, the GAFS aerosols, as well as the no fire and orthopogenic emission case, as they don't have much impact, not as much impact on the sea salt as with other aerosols. So we have checked the column integral of dust, organic carbon, black carbon, sulfate and sea salt. They all appear to be similar to the GAFS aerosol, which we consider as the truth. Then we move on to the uh, aerosol optical depths, which ultimately will affect the meteorology field. So here is what we have. Uh, we look at the aerosol we averaged over the month of June, which is the second month of the integration. Uh, in order to compare to the aerosol optical depth from the NASA website. Um, we try to match, her, ma match the color bar as much as we can. So in this uh, upper left uh, panel, I circle in this red one, we see that's the, uh, the dust storm with AOD, which is bigger than one. However, in our full chemistry experiment, we capture this uh, in the upper right. So we capture the, this uh, dust uh, storm. However, the AOD is much weaker than in the um, uh, AOD from Terra Modis observations. And uh, in, in the observation, the the dust is the number one obvious feature, and the second one is over the Central Africa, the fire. However, in our case, um, the two month, the full camp case, the AOD from the fire appeared to be bigger than the AOD from dust, which is still under investigation. So in the blue circle here, when we in the case of no fire, the AOD did reduce the, um, compared to the full cam case. And uh, in terms of anthropogenic emission in the green circle, the AOD over East Asia is much reduced compared to the full chemistry case. So here is a uh, a look of the AOD for the second month of integration on the upper row compared to the surface downward short wave in the bottom row. So we focus on this uh, a few domains, South um, Africa as well as East Asia. So we see that the AOD reduction to some extent um, in doing the no fire case compared to the full cam, as well as the 10% anthropogenic emission. However, the 
the reaction from the surface downward short wave has some reduction, but not as much as we had expected. So in the here is a no fire case over Central and South Africa, as well as the East Asia um, in the case of uh, anthropogenic emission reduction. Um, the AOD comparison, um, here's uh, between MIR and uh, UPP. So currently there are two ways of calculating this AOD. Uh, we have seen the general pattern of the, the two methods are very similar. However, the UPP tend to have a higher value over East China, Africa, and some of the oceanic area. So in the model, we use the, the MIR method to calculate the AOD. So there, might, there may be one reason why the model um, simulated AOD is on the lower end. So to summarize, we uh, have carried out four experiments to assess aerosol impact on S2S predictions. There's a control run without chemistry, and then we have a full chemistry, and there's a no fire when we um, do not have daily update in biomass burning emission. And then we have a clean cam run that uh, uh, where we have Reduce the anthropogenic emission globally by 90%. So the AOD in the full chemistry run with the MIR method is too weak compared to the observations. And it, we are still um, under investigation of, of why and it's a work in progress. The AOD changes, nevertheless, are, consi are consistent with the reduction in prescribed anthropogenic emission um, and the exclusion of biomass burning. So we, um, for the future, this model setup will be used and also as well as coupled to the ocean as Jessica described as a part of the International Weekly project to look at the aerosol impact on S2S prediction. So that's all I have today. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Shen. Are there any questions? Uh, there are none in, in the Slack channel yet. Okay. okay, since there are no more, um, there aren't any questions, we can move right along. Again, Dan, thank you very much. And um, next Actually, there, there, is, there is one question from Yanju. How was the model initialized? Oh, the meteorology field is from GFS. The chemical, the aerosol species are prescribed. All right, that's the only question we have. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, I've gone ahead and made Paul the presenter. Okay, the next we have um, Paul Dermeyer, prelim preliminary assessment of land surface energy and water budgets and land atmosphere interactions in UFS. Paul, are you ready to present? I need you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't unmuting per, on my side for some reason. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a, a preliminary assessment that we're doing uh, myself uh, with uh, Mike Eck and Ben Cash, who very graciously did all the explaining of the model setup two talks ago, so I don't have to repeat that. Um, um, my apologies for breaking in, but at, Paul, at least I do not see your screen. I don't know if others okay. are having your screen. Mm, all right. Yeah. It says it's showing okay, my right. screen. Now, oh, now I see it's the presenter mode. 
Yeah. Let's see. Is so that correct now? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Now it's yeah, it's switched around automatically. Um, so this sub project is validating a couple land atmosphere processes in UFS. This is part of the uh, monstrous UFS R2O project on component models piece in the M uh, MERS2S application team. So maybe it's really a sub sub project or maybe even three subs. The motivation here, as shown in the schematic, is that um, impact of initialization of the land surface um, is potentially very important on these sort of subseasonal seven to 14 day period, particularly, but anywhere between basically the very first day of a forecast out to about a month or more. Land surface and its feedbacks with the atmosphere are extremely important. Initialization is important. Having the models represent coupled land atmosphere behavior is extremely important, particularly since um, we all live on land. That's kind of where all, all the interaction is going on. So implications for, um, for so much uh, agriculture, droughts, floods, et cetera, uh, are really modulated by these feedbacks between the land and the atmosphere. And this coupling, we would take a very uh, process-oriented view of trying to understand how these work, largely through the energy and water cycles. And the improvements in models and the for improvements in forecasts really come from looking at these multivariate relationships, how these arrows link these uh, various components you see on the, the diagram on the right-hand side. So we calculate metrics from um, co-located in space and time measurements or model data of key variables that define these uh, process chains that go through both the energy and water cycles. And then our goal is to confront the forecast models uh, with them. In other words, do the models reproduce observed relationships? And so this is an approach that's kind of been uh, born out of uh, GUX and WCRP, the World Climate Research Program, um, over the last 15, 20 years, we've been developing and we're looking now to apply this to UFS. So we're gonna be evaluating that coupled model behavior using these sort of GUX ideas and multivariate statistics in the form of these coupling metrics, how, how these um, linkages between variables um, are depicted in the models. There are terrestrial processes. These are the ones that link land states to surface fluxes, things like how does soil moisture affect the partitioning of net radiation between sensible heat flux and latent heat flux. This is largely an evaluation then of the land surface model, because usually the land surface component has most of, if not all of the control over this piece of the, this link in the chain. Atmospheric processes link those surface fluxes sort of the next level up to the near surface uh, meteorological terms like two meter temperature and humidity, boundary layer characteristics, the stability of the vertical profile, uh, mixing rates, the depth of the daytime growing boundary layer, ultimately cloud formation and precipitation. And this is largely an evaluation of the atmospheric model physics, especially boundary layer processes, but also uh, convective parameterizations when those are, are in play, um, even cloud microphysics, uh, turbulence, all that, all that good stuff. And so spanning the entire chain is really looking at this entire linkage all the way from things like soil moisture through to precipitation and cloud development. And it's essential to get right, uh, to get the right to predict the phenomenon like droughts and heat waves and so forth, because you, you've got to have all the pieces in the chain working correctly. If, if one of them's not working, then the whole system will, will break down and, and it will affect the skill. So step zero is just to check surface energy budgets. Do they balance? This is the first thing any GWEXI person like myself would do when given a data set that has all of the budget terms. And it seems like a trivial, obvious, of course, thing that, that ought to work, but you'd be amazed how infrequently uh, you find energy balances in climate models and weather models. They ought to balance always, unless there's data assimilation going on, which violates closure because you have analysis increments, but in any forecast mode or open loop mode, 
we would expect to find balances in energy and in water. If a model does not balance, there can be many reasons uh, why things would go wrong. Maybe all the variables that you need aren't there in the output, so you, you just don't have the information that you need. Variables can be misdefined, misidentified, undescribed, misdescribed in the metadata. Errors in post-processing, which means that the model was fine, the problem came later in the process. There could be errors in the model. Or, and the, the red print here is foreshadowing, compromises have been made somewhere such that there is a lack of consistency in calculations in different parts of the modeling scheme, approximations, um, truncated loops, and iterative solutions, and so forth. So what we found, oh, and one other point, just to um, say that in, in the past we have found, just looking at land surface models here, this was 15 years ago in the second Global Soil Wetness Project, where we did a thorough check of energy balances across, in this case, uh, 15 different models that were participating and 13 of them had problems so this isn't anything unusual to find issues a lot of them are simple problems of how a variable is defined or, or something but in fact what we found back then was that about half of all the problems that, that were we were able to diagnose uh, were things that had arisen in NOAA the land surface scheme that was used at the time by MSEP EMC and pretty much that same model is what is the default uh, even now in UFS. So the experiment, this is basically what uh, Ben Cash described earlier, except what I'm going to show you is from the even lower resolution C384 runs. When we look at the, the uh, higher runs, it's essentially the same. We see the same kind of issues. For energy balance or imbalance, the way we determine that is we calculate net radiation from the available terms, which as it turns out, are all really be coming from the atmospheric component, um, from the, the GFS component. There are both time average and instantaneous values there. We're outputting data hourly, so a time average is just once every hour. And the heat fluxes, the surface heat fluxes shown, sensible plus latent minus the ground heat flux plus snow, but what I'm going to show you are uh, basically CONUS runs initialized in July, so there's no snow. So uh, we don't really have to worry about that. And the imbalance is the net surface radiation minus total surface heat fluxes. We would expect to see pretty much zero. That's not what we're seeing. Using the time average terms, this is the average imbalance over forecast days two to five, averaged across multiple years, just to make sure this isn't some sort of a one-off problem and we see this across pretty steadily across all eight years. Imbalances, if you can't read the scale, mostly in the range plus and minus up to three watts per meter squared. Is this a problem with lossy compression in the net CDF output? No, this would be down in the fractions, tiny fractions of a watt. So that's clearly not what's going on. These these data are automatically reprojected um, from the cube sphere onto a lat long grid. We've checked that. Is that the problem? No. You wouldn't get spatial patterns this way with reprojection. Is it tied to land surface features? Maybe. It kind of looks, you know, these colors kind of outlining deserts and forests and things like that. Are there other things going on? Probably. So if we rescale the colors and zoom in, one thing that pops out immediately is that we see cities. So there are urban cells or urban land cover type in NOAA, and they've been sort of tweaked the hydrologic properties to make them look, act more city-like, but that shouldn't be a source of imbalance. That's just going to change the, the surface fluxes around a little bit, but that's a place where we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of signal here. Oh, and as an aside, you see a lot of things around the coastlines, a lot of large numbers. Uh, don't worry about that. That is a reprojection issue that comes from the fact that there's no ground heat flux over water. And so that generates a, a spurious looking imbalance that's not really an imbalance. Um, but really we're concerned about what's going on away from the coastlines. Okay, so back to this map. Although this isn't exactly the same map, this is now the instantaneous terms, but it's almost indistinguishable from the time mean version that I showed before. We see features. Uh, red is where net radiation is larger than the total of the surface fluxes. The boreal forests across Canada show up very clearly in that color. Um, 
the deserts in the southwest show up as blue. There, the fluxes are larger than the net radiation. We can see western mountain ranges pretty well as being red, but not in California. That red tongue that sticks down into California is actually kind of going through the Central Valley and not the Sierra Nevadas. And then the Appalachians show up kind of green, weakly blue as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. If we zoom in on a single point and look at a time series now, uh, we begin to get a handle on what's happening. We never get a balance, not on any of these hours. There's a clear day-night dichotomy going on though. We can see it's basically positive imbalances during the daytime, negative at night. There's an ongoing imbalance that might be due, and this is from handling discussions uh, with uh, Mike Barlage um, and Mike Eck and others, that there's a linear approximation inside of NOAA for long wave radiation, which is inconsistent with the long wave that's being calculated in the AGCM, which is your standard sigma t to the fourth approach. Um, so um, this is actually something that's probably almost certainly contributing. And this average value has these downward spikes that you see in the black curves periodically, which is something else going on. I'll show in the next slide what's happening there. But it's pretty clear that this is one of those physics inconsistencies that CCPP is going to be addressing. Um, you, we don't have the same laws of physics in the land model and the atmosphere, and that needs to be made consistent because the radiation within, or the, the energy within NOAA is balancing, but it's not using the same radiation terms that the atmosphere is. So again, one of these consistency issues in the physics. What are these spikes about? It's basically an imbalance of the imbalances, the average minus the instantaneous that highlights now, you can see where these spikes are. And we see that they correlate with places where the green line now is total cloud cover goes through a, a quick change from clear to cloudy or cloudy to clear. So the spikes are indicative of large one-time step imbalances. They happen whenever the cloud comes and goes. The radiation in this model is called hourly and these line up with the data output interval. So, and this is apparently, uh, Mike Eck tells me, kind of a known issue uh, in no, these imbalances when the solar radiation changes quickly. And again, probably tied, or is tied to that long wave radiation inconsistency in the calculation. So, our experiences so far, the bummers. Uh, lack of output files, metadata, and lack of GFS documentation, either inline in the code or external, are frustrating. You know, we only find out what's going on when we start talking to each other, which is a good reason we're talking to each other. But um, this is a longstanding problem uh, with, with uh, GFS and the global model. It's just not really having all the information that we need. And as a result, it's been very slow for us to get out of the gate with model diagnosis until we know what we've got in the model output. Uh, when we look at the model output, there's very little metadata there, very little description. Oftentimes even units can be wrong. And, and other concerns like this that have been voiced by others, they also apply here. But it's a real positive, and Ben made this same point, we can run code ourselves on multiple platforms now, which is a big payoff of the work to make this a community model and getting a lot more eyeballs on the data, on the output, on the code. Uh, so the community can use it, we can analyze it, we can improve things. Um, we're gonna have a postdoc starting on this project, not yet in, uh, one September, hopefully, is when that will start. That will greatly improve the pace of our ability to do these diagnoses. And we're also looking very much forward to working with the Revitalized Land Group at EMC with uh, a Mike Barlage coming over there. So um, we're barely out of the starting gates here, but um, uh, a lot of promise that we can, we can make some advances. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so Mike Barlage actually um, uh, put a question into Slack. Do, uh, do you feel that single column models contain enough information to use the coupling metrics of evaluation? And if so, can verification OBS, such as the lasso, be used to evaluate the coupling, or are they too constrained by the assumptions in the LES model? Uh, excellent question. I think, yes, that can be very useful. And in fact, we're doing exactly that in a parallel project uh, funded by NASA CPO and the land 
climate process team. So um, that is a way to, there's several issues you can do with LES, you can get down to really small scales, but in the single column model, that provides a really cost efficient way to do some of this diagnosis. So the short answer is yes. All right, there are no further questions.